The following program was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. American citizens have the right to be provided work so that they can support their families decently and properly. Now is the time to fight, to fight for the best interest of our city, and we have public housing was finally recognized as a proper function of government. It's not done by speeches. The LaGuardia Archives at LaGuardia Community College of the City University of New York presents The Dreamer and the Doer, The Life and Work of Fiorello LaGuardia, with narrator Tony LoBianco. <laughs> During the 1920s, it appeared that prosperity might go on forever. A booming economy sent consumers on a non-stop spending spree, while prices on the New York Stock Exchange soared to dizzying heights. America's optimism was reflected in the words of Herbert Hoover, who predicted in early 1929 that, with the policies of the last eight years, we shall soon be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from the nation. One public official, Congressman Fiorello LaGuardia, took a different view of the country's future. LaGuardia represented a congressional district with many poor immigrants. Perhaps he found it easy then to recognize that the problems of poverty and unemployment, far from being banished, were actually beginning to grow. Ernest Cuneo was a congressional aide to LaGuardia. He was saying, look at the handwriting on the wall. He was right. He was saying, you watch the stock market going up. I'm watching the unemployment going up. You talk about the arts. I'm talking about the people who have to search for a living. He was a Jeremiah. After the stock market crash of 1929, Fiorello became a prophet in his own time. Once the Great Depression began, he would prove to be more than a prophet. LaGuardia provided ideas and leadership to deal with the economic crisis effectively. From the start, Fiorello called on the federal government to intervene and provide direct relief to the unemployed. At the time, it seemed like a radical proposal, and only a small number of politicians agreed with LaGuardia. Yet, federal relief programs, programs like the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, eventually became a centerpiece of the New Deal. When this song was first performed on Broadway in the Gold Diggers of 1933, America was in the depths of the Great Depression. 25% of the working population had lost their jobs. In New York City alone, one million people were unemployed. They used to tell me I was building a dream With peace and glory ahead Why should I be standing in line Just waiting for bread Once I built a railroad I made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done, brother and paradise. Judge Edmund Palmieri served as LaGuardia's law clerk while he was mayor. Palmieri says a song written by Yip Harburg aptly describes conditions in New York City during the Depression. I don't know whether you've ever heard that song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? But whenever I hear that song, it makes my blood run cold because uh, I saw so many people who were ruined by the Depression, 
intelligent, uh, God-fearing, law-abiding persons who had been frugal in their lifestyles, who had saved money, and who had absolutely nothing left. And I remember seeing this line of, of well-dressed ex executives or middle, uh, what we would now call the middle-level executives, each one with a box of apples, and they were only about five or six feet apart on Broadway, practically the whole distance from Fulton Street to Wall Street, trying to sell apples. Well, there were too many people on down their luck and too many apples to be sold, and I didn't see very many apples sold, but it was a depressing sight, a very depressing sight. Well, we had no welfare, no unemployment relief, None of the services that we have today to alleviate the problems of the unemployed existed in those days. And so we had people without shelter, without food, without jobs, whose only recourse was to rely on the, on the goodwill and the charity of their neighbors. And some of them didn't fare well at all. Hey, don't you remember? I'm your pal, buddy, can you spare a dime? Historically, whenever America faced an economic crisis, private charities came to the rescue. The Depression, however, was far more severe than any previous crisis. Private charities ran out of funds. The city borrowed money to finance its relief efforts. But even this proved inadequate to help the masses of unemployed workers. And the majority of the needy received no help whatsoever. Peter Pascal worked at one of the city's settlement houses. There was no, no assistance at all that we had at that particular time. The political clubs on uh, Thanksgiving would give maybe 5,000 turkeys and things like that. And it was a whole different uh, ball game in those days that you weren't thinking about how we were going to make jobs. I think it was a question of how the hell the people were going to exist until something happened. And, you know, everybody says, well, tomorrow it's going to get better. And, uh, well, things didn't get better. They got worse. Many people blame President Hoover for doing little or nothing to alleviate the desperate situation. In fact, the president did undertake economic measures. The government loaned millions of dollars to banks and insurance companies in an attempt to stimulate the economy. No earlier president had taken a step like this to alleviate a crisis, but Hoover did not want a vast public works program that might unbalance the federal budget, nor did he believe in federal welfare relief. Here's Hoover in a 1931 radio address. The maintenance of a spirit of mutual self-help through voluntary giving the responsibility of local government is of infinite importance to the future of America. Everyone who aids to the full extent of his ability is giving support to the very foundations of our democracy. Everyone who from a sympathetic heart gives to these services is giving hope and courage to some deserving family. Everyone who aids in this service will have lightened a beacon of help on a stormy coast of human adversity. Across the country, the unemployed were staging massive demonstrations, demanding government relief programs. It was the demand for change that finally led to the defeat of Hoover in 1932 and the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In his first inaugural address, delivered on March 4, 1933, Roosevelt sounded the keynote of his new administration. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Roosevelt began to help the unemployed immediately with direct relief payments through the newly established Federal Emergency Relief Administration. He was vigorously supported by Fiorello. In the early days of the Depression, LaGuardia had been among the first congressmen to call for federal unemployment insurance. He also advocated a program of public works. Shortly after his election as mayor, 
Fiorello was on his way to Washington to meet with Harry Hopkins, one of FDR's closest advisors and head of the federal emergency relief effort. LaGuardia had developed a close relationship with the Roosevelt administration while piloting some of the early New Deal legislation through Congress. In late 1933, the Little Flower conferred with Hopkins and helped him shape the new Civil Works Administration, or CWA, a massive federal public works program. LaGuardia and Hopkins believed that unemployed workers wanted jobs, not a dole. And FDR promised in his first inaugural address to provide these jobs. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. It can be accomplished in part by direct recruiting by the government itself, treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war, but at the same time through this employment accomplishing greatly needed projects to stimulate and reorganize the use of our great natural resources. Under CWA, almost 200,000 New Yorkers were employed on various public works projects during the winter of 1934. The weather that year was bitterly cold, and most of the CWA employees worked outside, refurbishing the city's parks and recreation areas. But at least these men had jobs. There were still more than one million more unemployed workers that CWA could not hire for lack of funds. The plight of the unemployed and their families affected Fiorello deeply. Edmund Palmieri. I remember when a teenage girl committed suicide because of the economic distress of her family, and she wrote a very pathetic letter describing the life she had at home, the struggles of her family to make both ends meet, even to put enough food on the table, her own sorrow at finding herself in an atmosphere in which she saw a little hope, and she, she committed suicide. I'll never forget the effect that it had on Mayor LaGuardia. He was beside himself with sorrow and with rage because, number one, he felt that it, it was a case where uh, just the slightest amount of help and encouragement would have prevented it. And he called in all the social workers who had had anything to do with this girl's family. And he went over that case with a fine tooth comb to see whether the persons in charge of it had done their duty. He had a very tender spot in his heart for children. And the suffering of children was something he, he couldn't accept. To improve New York's relief efforts, Fiorella succeeded in getting special taxes passed, among them an increase in the city's sales tax. And Fiorello knew that substantial assistance had to continue flowing from Washington. But in 1934, after CWA had been operating only a few months, FDR canceled the program. He was worried about its enormous costs and sensitive to the criticism coming from conservatives who opposed a massive public works program. In New York City, the reaction to cancellation of CWA was immediate. Groups of CWA workers demonstrated at City Hall to the music of the socialist anthem, the Internationale. Unemployment began to rise again, with 1,500 people a day applying for relief. One of the agencies that had been set up to help them was the Municipal Committee for the Relief of Homeowners, where Stanley Kreutzer worked. Our job was to try to help people from being kicked out of their homes, try to help people from being foreclosed out of their homes, trying to help in one way or another to keep people on what you might call an even keel so that 
while they had no jobs, the banks would not be hard on them, and so on and so forth. It was a very difficult task for most of us, but somehow we helped. Municipal committees were stopgap measures. The city needed much more. In September 1934, Fiorello led a delegation from the U.S. Conference of Mayors to a meeting with President Roosevelt. He urged the president to let the federal government to assume complete responsibility for unemployment relief programs. Meanwhile, FDR had been receiving reports of growing unrest across the country. Unemployed workers were demanding jobs. These factors, combined with a strong showing of Democrats in the congressional elections that year, persuaded the president to propose a massive new public works program. When FDR unveiled the Works Progress Administration in early 1935, he described the WPA's goal to the American people in one of his radio fireside chats. This is a great national crusade, a crusade to destroy enforced idleness, which is an enemy of the human spirit generated by this depression. Our attack upon these enemies must be without stint, and without discrimination, no sectional, no political distinctions can be permitted. As soon as the WPA was established, Fiorello moved to take advantage of the federal largesse. Seymour Graubard worked for the mayor. I recall that when uh, the federal government finally got appropriations for uh, public service work, WPA, PWA, or whatnot, uh, in, uh, to help uh, the poor and the unemployed, New York City was first in line of all the sub political subdivisions of the nation uh, with programs to put people to work. This was largely due to Bob Moses, who had foreseen this weeks in advance and had drawn detailed plans for putting people to work. Plans drawn up by the Parks Commissioner Robert Moses and his staff for a variety of public works projects so impressed New Dealers like Harry Hopkins the new head of the WPA, that many of these projects were approved. But as important as detailed planning was Fiorello's close personal friendship, not only with Harry Hopkins, but with the president himself. LaGuardia advisor A.A. A. Burrow. We had an alliance between the mayor and the president. For one thing, uh, since we needed jobs, we got an awful lot of public works. As you look around New York City today, a lot of the things that you see came right out of that. By October 1935, WPA was employing 200,000 New Yorkers. Over the next few years, these and thousands like them in PWA would literally transform the entire appearance of the city. Miles of new highways, public swimming pools and beaches, giant bridges and tunnels were all built with federal money. Gildo Spadoni is a painter who worked on some of these projects. That time was no depression, that was the end of it. 1933 was really depression, but after the very 33, 34, 35, yeah, and then 38 started the war, fell, then everybody went to work. <laughs> Speaking at the dedication of another public works project, the First Avenue Market, Fiorello paid tribute to the men employed by the WPA who built it. Here is the proof of what WPA can do. True, the city provided the material, but I want you to think of this, that this building is a monument to the idea that American citizens who through no fault of their own are unable to find work have the right to be provided work so that they can support their families decently and properly. The primary goal of the WPA was providing jobs for people in fields where they had worked before the Depression. As a leading cultural center, New York had a large number of unemployed writers and actors, painters, and musicians. Using this talent pool, WPA funded projects ranging from painting giant murals to staging first-run plays. John Steinway, now retired from the Steinway and Sons Piano Company, recalls WPA theater during the 30s. My father was always interested in the theater, uh, the arts of all kinds. He was an amateur actor and had many friends in the theater. So he was very conscious of what was going on, particularly the WPA theater. I went with him many times and got to see a lot of those things and loved it. I remember seeing Orson Welles, people like that. 
doing federal theater project stuff down on 40th Street. For no good reason, just jit. From the start until the finish comes, they feed him out of garbage cans, they breed him in the slums. Joe. It brought theater to the people, in quotation marks, because it was very cheap. As I remember, it was less than a dollar to get any into any of those shows, so that it was accessible to everybody. Commissioner Robert Moses made the WPA work in New York City. The diverse landscape of today's Central Park was constructed by the WPA. Some of the finest swimming pools in the city were constructed by the WPA. Moses insisted in using the WPA only if the planning and the supervision were done by his own employees. When the WPA supervised its own projects, they did not always run this smoothly. Administrative practices were often ineffective. This situation began to change in 1936 when the Roosevelt administration appointed a new WPA administrator to New York City, Colonel Somerville, a member of the Army Corps of Engineers. Historian Barbara Bloomberg says Somerville improved WPA operations. Because of the careful planning and many other changes that Somerville introduced, the New York City WPA operated at its peak effectiveness between 1936 and 1939. The WPA proceeded, under the Colonel's guidance, not only to employ between 100,000 and 200,000 New Yorkers, but also to use their abilities more efficiently than in its earlier days. Among the projects the New York WPA took on were the LaGuardia Airport in Queens, as well as construction work at the New York World's Fair. Speaking at the World's Fair in 1940, Fiorello praised the WPA's accomplishments. And now, may I take the liberty to speak for the WPA workers. I've lived with you now for over six years. I've conferred with every mayor of every large city in this country. of all that has been accomplished. And in a month, as for this moment, I am on a national network. I want to say that the WPA workers owe nothing to anybody. They earn everything that they've been paid. Whatever the WPA accomplished, it remained one of the most controversial aspects of the New Deal. In Washington, especially among conservative politicians, the WPA was often referred to as a make-work program for people who were too lazy to find real jobs. Budget appropriations for the WPA were always in jeopardy of being cut back. Fiorello once ruefully described the process which he understood all too well. No one knew better than Fiorello the havoc caused in New York City each time WPA funds were reduced. For example, in 1936, over 40,000 workers were forced off the payroll. Since most of them couldn't find jobs in private industry, they were back onto relief. The laid-off workers staged protest demonstrations, and the WPA artists went out on strike. Harry Gottlieb is former president of the Artists' Union. We had the first sit-down strike in New York. So they sit and started, and uh, toward uh, midnight around there, the cops were called in, and they beat up quite a few artists, and arrested, arrested the, the rest of them. And the case was heard the next day. At the hearing, the attorney representing the artists came up with an unusual defense. Your Honor, 
uh, I would like these officers who arrested these people to identify them. Who are they? In other words, now they, what happened was that the, the artist gave the craziest names. They said one said he was Michelangelo, the other said he was, he was Rembrandt. The cops couldn't, couldn't identify them. So they, the whole thing, that was it. They, they were let, let, let free. In the 1930s, the WPA faced its share of problems. In New York, some difficulties came from LaGuardia's relationship with the city council, which Tammany Hall Democrats controlled through most of his tenure as mayor. The council accused the WPA, as well as the city welfare department, of waste and inefficiency. There was some truth to these accusations. Some relief projects were mismanaged, and some people on relief were not entitled to it. But historian Mark Nason points out that politics, and not inefficiency, were behind the city council's criticism. Tammany Hall did not want a massive government program that superseded the local politicians. For them, politics was a business in which services were granted for votes. LaGuardia's efforts to bring money into New York produced results. It bypassed the Tammany politicians, and they resented it. Tammany wanted to control the city government, but with LaGuardia in power, they couldn't do that. As mayor, Fiorello helped to create a new relationship between city and federal government while bringing jobs and relief payments to hundreds of thousands of unemployed New Yorkers. By the early 1940s, the economic crisis had passed. America was on the road to full recovery, and our entry into World War II would start the economy booming again. Relief payments could be cut back, and the nation's public works programs ended. But during the Depression, an important precedent had been established. Government was now responsible for providing relief for the unemployed. To Fiorello, this was the proper role of government. Edward Corsi was LaGuardia's close friend and advisor. I remember when LaGuardia decided to quit City Hall, he picked me up then and took me up to Gracie Mansion. And he began to reminisce a little bit about the years that he had served at City. And when he came to this question of relief, there were almost tears in his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, we fed him, didn't we, Ed? We fed him. Fiorello LaGuardia, the dreamer and the doer, has been made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Most of the archival material for this series was provided by the LaGuardia Archives, by the New York City Municipal Archives and Records Center, and by WNYC. The project director is Richard K. Lieberman. The narrator was Tony Lobianco. Project coordinator, Susan Farkas. Scriptwriter, Dick Wirth. The historical consultants, Roy Rosenzweig, Kenneth T. Jackson, Deborah Gardner, Paul Barrett, Thomas Kessner, Joshua Freeman, Mark Nason, Barbara Blumberg, and David Rosner. The administrator, Edwina Estrella. Original theme music is by Mark Lamparello. The mixing engineer is Gary Fink. Associate producer, Susan Vernon. The producer is Tom Vitale. <laughs>